John chapter 12. And if today is your first time in this church, our warm greetings to you. Please, after the service, just hang around so we can get to know you more and to shake your hands. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. And I will glorify it again. Then the crowd that stood there and heard it say that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Oh, our Father, uh, rise and let your enemies be scattered. Amen. Please be seated in the house of God again. Ah. And again, before I forget, thank you all guys, those who walked through the late, late night yesterday. We are putting facilities, uh, some more facilities, like we have added one air conditioner uh, by Elias. And I think here is colder now. I don't know how <laughs> I'm shaking it in my heart. So we have added one more air conditioner here and there for your comfort. And as we prepare for our conference. Hopefully the flyer should be out but between now and Tuesday. So do share the flyers and invite people. June 12th is, um, is the democracy day. It is a public holiday. So invite your friends. Between the hours of 10 and 3 p.m. will be out. So you can go enjoy your evening with your friends, hopefully responsibly. So please invite all your friends and colleagues to our June 12th uh, Bible conference. And, uh, and don't forget, We'll be doing another round of uh, membership induction, hopefully by June 13th. So if you, are, if you are yet to be a member of this church, please pick up a form. Uh, see this, uh, the, yeah, Elias, the, the tall guy, and collect uh, a membership form and return it back to us. And then we'll process you for membership. The subject that I would like to discuss very quickly with us this morning is the cross, the glory of God. The cross is the glory of God. Last week, I shared with us the agony of Christ as he began to face the inevitability of the Passion Week, the week that he will be humiliated because of our sins and then moved on to, uh, to Calvary and then to the grave and then face his resurrection. And one of the points, as we look at the, the, the boiling moment in our Lord's uh, time, his, his, his heart could not contain what was going on in his humanity. Uh, I did mention to us that it shows us that Christ is human. It reveals to us his humanity. And clearly, and very much clearly, I put that before you, that you must understand the humanity of Christ as Christians. Christ is both God 100% and man 100%. It is when you identify with his humanity that you can really see the value of his suffering. He was not suffering just like God, and he was not feeling the pain. No, he did felt the pain. The pains that he went through was real and was very, very, very excruciating and painful. Very, very painful. And all those things happen, not just because of the whole world. Yes, it is for the sake of the whole world, but because of myself, because of me, 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 me. He died for all the individual Christians and all that he will call to himself in the course of time. 
So this morning, I want us to look at how God, how God's glory manifests itself in the cross. I hope that in a few minutes, I can draw some good points of applications uh, to us today. The glory of God is seen in the value of the cross. The value of the cross. Jesus praying in verse 28 or asking the Father to glorify his name in what he was passing through at that moment and what he will eventually pass through a few days from this moment. And then a voice came from heaven, verse 28, and said, I have glorified it and I will glorify it uh, again. And this is not the first time Christ has asked, uh, uh, has, has, uh, asked for the Lord to glorify it in verse 23. When the Greeks came to, to meet him, he said, he answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And, and he's talking about, talking about his death. Now, the, what, the, the, the context of this passage that I've read in your hearing this morning is, is, is the context of the cross because verse 32, verse 33 tells us that when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the immediate context of this passage is about his cross. And, and, and in, in, this, in, in, in this context, we see, uh, uh, but before I talk about the glory of God as is seen in this context, is the question is, what is glorious about the cross, about what Christ was up, uh, going to suffer? There was a hymn that said, on a hill far away stood uh, the old rugged cross, the emblem of, uh, suffering and shame. I mean, the, the entirety of the Passion Week, the entirety of the humiliation of the Son of God, it, it, it's, it's, there's nothing on the surface that seems glorious about the cross. It, it, what, what is glorious about flogging a man, not just a son of God, just ordinary man, like Brother Abel now, which is like, or like myself, with properly dressed, and then the Sun City's uh, security guys are flogging a well-dressed, I mean, what is honorable? What is glorious in the cross? I mean, if you have been to Army Checkpoint before, and then they ask to do from job, and you have to oblige, regardless of what you are wearing, what is honorable or what is glorious in that? But we see that God, when Christ talked about Father, glorify your name in these things. He said, I have glorified it. And, and, and the, the neuter, the it, not him or you, suggests very strongly that he's talking about the cross, that I have placed my glory on the cross and I'll do it again and again. This is the focus of my glory. And, and of course, the cross is a thing of shame. Isaiah 53 tells us, Isaiah 53 verse one, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and esteemed, and we esteem him not. The entire enterprise of the cross is, is shameful. It's shameful. It is pure humiliation. In fact, we, we hide our face when, we, when, when the disciples look upon the humiliation of their master. And when we, even today, when we look back and look at the cross by faith, it's like we hide our face from him because it is a thing of, of shame. But it is in this thing of shame that God has placed his glory. The glory of God is the entire worth of his magnificence, the entire worth of his person, the weight of his person is what his glory is all about. And we can look here and see that the cross 
is, is the centerpiece of God's the demonstration of God's glory. And how, how, how is it we see that God did demonstrate his love for his son here, here in this process? Because the son speak, the father responded as if the entire heaven kitchen cabinet as we are moved into Jerusalem at this point to be with the son. See the love of the father for his son demonstrated here at this moment. He was never left alone. God was participating at his way with his son in his humiliation. And God said, I have glorified it and I'll do it again. I am with you, proving that he is the one that has sent him and he has put a mark of authority and approval of what the son is doing and what is about to pass through. We also see this demonstration of God's glory in the love of God. The cross is a demonstration of, of God's love for humanity. John chapter 3, verse 16 tells us that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. When we look at the cross, the cross is the, is, 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 is the highest point of the demonstration of God's love for humanity. Amen. Amen. So, that, that, so God's glory is seen on, on the cross. He valued the cross so much. He placed his glory as it were he, God's premium, highest premium was on the cross because the cross will solve all the issues of humanity. We see God's glory in the value of the cross. The cross is so valuable to God. It's precious to God because the cross is going to prove decisive in redemptive history. The cross is going to demonstrate the love that exists between God the Father and God the Son. The, the cross is going to demonstrate the love that God has for humanity all, at all time. So God places highest premium on the cross. Even though it looks like the thing of shame to the onlookers, but for God, his very heart, his very nature, his very being moves at the cross. The second thing we see uh, here is the voice of God. That when Christ was going through this agony of hearts, God speak audibly to the hearing of the people. Even though they could not decipher what it is, some people thought it's a thunder, some people thought it is an angel that spoke to him, but it was a voice of God speaking to people standing by very, very audibly. But it was only Jesus that could hear that voice. The rest of the crowd could not really decipher what the voice is, is, is all about. And this reminds us of the church in the wilderness. Remember, when God called them out of Egypt, he asked Moses to bring them up to him, to Sinai, that he might speak to them by himself, and by doing so, inscribe his laws upon the tablets of their heart. But you remember uh, that, of course, by this time in Exodus, man has been separated from God because of the fall of Adam. Man no longer hear God speak, even if God attempts to speak to him. Man no longer have the capacity, the inner receptivity to the voice of God. So bringing them up to Sinai, God chooses to speak to them or attempt to speak to them in chapter 20 of the book of Exodus. And Moses recounted it in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 25. But when, when they heard the voice of God, they ran away. They could not stand it. And they said, Moses, only you should go and hear the voice of God and come back and talk to us. And then we will do whatever God speaks to you. We see God breaking through again here, not just once, not just twice, but three times in the life of our master, Jesus, speaking audibly to the people, yet they could not really decipher his voice. But we are happy that here, a man like us, our brother, a man in the flesh, could hear God audibly because of his relationship with the Father, with the Father. That even in his humanity, he was able to hear God clearly that God 
speaks that I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. And, and one key point you need to take away from here is that in Christ, God has spoken so that in speaking to the Son and the Son hearing him, we too can hear God through the Son by the Holy Spirit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God has spoken. We on our own, we by ourselves, cannot hear God. We've been alienated from God. We are like, we are like beasts. It's, it's like you are speaking grammar to your goats or to your chicken. They can't hear it because they don't share the same nature with you. But in Christ, we've seen a man that have the nature of God, that have the capacity to hear when the almighty God speak audibly by himself, not through a medium. In the Old Testament, the prophets were ministered to, through the agencies of angels and through other mediums. But here we see God himself, not through angels, not through thundering, but speaking clearly by, his, by himself through his mouth to the people. But it is only Jesus that heard what was said to the people. In fact, what was said was not said to Jesus originally. Jesus said, this voice spoke not because of me, but for your sakes. But to those whom the words came, they could not hear it, but he heard it. They haven't heard it, it is like he had heard it on our behalf, because he is our kinsman, redeemer. And having heard God and continue to hear God, when he brings people, all those whom he will save to himself, they too can hear God without fear, without shame, without hiding their face. And brothers and sisters, God has spoken in his son. Hebrews 1 tells us that God at diverse time speak to us, speak to our fathers in diverse ways. But in this last day, he has spoken to us through his son, who is the heir of all things, that by our union with Christ, we can hear God. The only time any human being, any living human being can hear God clearly is when he is joined with Christ. God, I mean, there's, there are a lot of unbelievers that have this Bible in their houses. But merely looking at the Bible cannot convert any man. Merely reading the letters of the Bible cannot communicate grace to any man. It is by our union with Christ, it is by our union with Christ and by the active workings of the Holy Spirit that the voice of God is heard. The cross is the glory of God. He plays great value on it. The cross is the glory of God. By the cross, once, once again, we can hear the voice of God. Thirdly, the, voice, the cross is the glory of God because at the cross, we see the victory of God in Christ Jesus. We see the victory of Christ. Jesus speaking uh, here in verse 31. He said, now is the judgment of this world. Now would the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. You see, the idea of judgment here is not much, much, uh, it's not much more about uh, a declarative uh, kind of condemnative judgment as what Christ is saying here, what the Bible is saying here is when, when we come to the cross, when we come to this week of, God's, uh, of Christ's passion, when we come to these points of Christ's life, the world is being judged as in the world is being sh shown for who, the, for who he is, for who it is, or who he is. It is at the cross, we see who we really are. We see what the world really are. It is a display of man's incapacitation. It is a display that we really, really need a savior. Because here in there, the voice of God speaking from heaven, people were standing there. They couldn't hear it. And, and 
what we need to live is the word of God, isn't it? We need to speak to our father and he need to speak to us. But here we, we see the Jews and the disciples and the mixed multitude standing before Jesus and God speaking directly from heaven, they could not hear it. It shows our great, great, great incapacitation that without Christ, there is no way we can have any dealings with God ever again. Number two, it displays the utter wickedness, the, 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 the heinousness of unbelief in man, that regardless of what was happening, regardless of the voice from heaven, still they, they did not believe in him. You see, even though they could not decipher exactly what God said, somehow they could picture or figure out that there is a thundering from heaven, and some will even say that an angel speak from heaven. I mean, look at the way they are talking about it as if it is cheap for an angel to speak from heaven to anyone. I mean, this love moved them. At this point in Christ's life and journey, at this point, he has demonstrated to the Jews beyond any reasonable doubt that he is God. He has done some amazing, undeniable miracles. He, he has done a lot, and God has confirmed him by speaking audibly to the people, yet they could not perceive it. The judgment of the world is seen at the cross. Our incapacitation is, 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 is like we've been made, we've been laid bare before the whole world to see that without Christ, there is no way we can have any dealings with God so ever. At the cross, Satan is, is judged, not being, is judged. Satan was defeated at the cross. Jesus said, now uh, uh, the, the, the ruler of this world being cast out. The ruler of this world being cast out. And this echoing Colossians, I think Colossians chapter two, yes, verse 14, is talking about blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and Christ took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled the principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, tri triumphing over them in it. And the, the point here is, up to this point, Satan kind of ruled supreme. It's like Satan was holding humanity by the jugular and was dictating this, the, the pace of, of, of things that happens around there. But at the cross, the greatest enemy of God, the greatest enemy of, of humanity is being cast out, namely Satan. The glory of God is seen at the cross because at the cross, Satan is cast out. Of course, our incapacitation is being seen, but Satan is cast out. He is not being, he's not going to be cast out. The, the, if, as far as Satan is concerned, Christ has finished him. He's finished. I, I don't want to use this word, but let me try to use it. Technically, no, it's not, that, not technically defeated. It, Satan was not technically defeated at the cross. He was properly, properly and convincingly defeated at the cross. And here, the glory of God is being, when God's cross is being lifted up on the cross. And as Satan, as cross is being lifted up on the cross, Satan was going down. And from that moment, even till now, and before Christ comes back, all those who are held in his captivity are being released one after the other to the kingdom of God's dear son. All of us here this morning are the testimony of the loss of Satan. Us and thousands and thousands of fellow Christians around the world are the testimony of the great loss of Satan, of the great defeat of Satan. All those who are Christians who have come to faith in the Lord Jesus have escaped from the captivity of Satan. Not just, they are not being, they've escaped completely from the captivity of Satan. Amen. And you and I are the living testimony.
of, of that. Let me just speak to you from my heart, few points of application this morning. The first thing I want you to take home is beware of how you look at God's work. You see, the moment of great humiliation of his son is also the moment of the display of his glory. The crowd, the mob, they saw, they, they saw shame. God saw glory. You see, be careful. Most the stumbling block for unbelievers to the Greeks and to the educated ones is how can Jesus die if he is so powerful? How can he how can he went through the humiliation? They, they, they are so concerned about the physicality of Christ that but God is being glorified. God is being glorified. He's going up on the cross, he's going down to the grave. A great honor on the path of God. He is bringing honor to God. For the unsaved, the cross is a sign of weakness. It's a sign of shame. But for us, it's the part of God. Let me read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You can turn to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernments of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weaknesses of God is stronger than men. Amen. For the undiscerning, the cross is the zenith of humiliation for this man from Galilee. But the power and glory of God has been demonstrated through the agency of that cross. God could have saved us without going through the hassle of the cross, isn't it? Because God is sovereign. God could have saved us by a tap of his fingers, but he chose that through the sacrifice of his son, men and women can come back to him as sons and daughter, that's the, the path that God chooses for his son. For those who are not being saved, it is weakness. And, and Christianity is the only religion that you found out that the, the leader died as a sacrifice for his fellow followers. There is no other religion around the world that you can, the leader died as a sacrifice for his followers. It is shameful, but in the eyes of God, it is glorious. God chose that the son passes through the cross and then win the crown for himself and on behalf of his, of his people. Now, for us in this hall this morning, Christian life sometimes can be hard. In fact, indeed, it's hard. Last week, I told us that Christ in his humanity felt that uncertainty, that pain, that pang of knowing that this, this is exactly what I ought to do, but my body is not agreeing with my mind and with my heart. But this is the will of God for me, like as we heard from Anana, of, of Anana this morning. This is what God wants me to do. 
But I don't really want to go and face this fall. It's a murderer. But, but this is what God wants. Me. Those uncertainty, those moments of indecision, it can be hard. And we should not despise the point of, 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 of sacrifice in our Christian life. Our Christian life is full of sacrifice. Sometimes it's full of pains. It's full of thorns. But our joy is that we are in union with Christ and we are God's children. And very soon, and soon and very soon, we shall be in Zion. Amen. Be careful with therapeutic gospel. Any gospel that is preached that suggests that Christian cannot be sick. I was listening, I was saying Eliza yesterday, one of the popular preacher here in the country, uh, who is going through some tough times at the moment, was preaching the first Sunday of this month and said, this is our month of this, this, this. let me not give you details. But it says something that broke my heart. They said during their communion service that the disciples ate the Holy Communion and there was no single record of them ever having headaches, that they were never sick. That if they were sick, the Bible could have recorded it to us. That anyone that ate of the Holy Communion, that drank the wine, and he would say the wine is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. This, <laughs> that was the first time I just, I said, Peter, wake up, wake up, you are, you are learning new things. The wine that is the wine is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That when you, when you drink of it and eat of the, of, 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 you can never be sick. That even headache is not the portion of believers. I said, sure. So Saul, or Apostle Paul should be in hell right now, isn't it? Because he was sick all through his life. Or Epaphroditus. Or Timothy. All, 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 the, all the apostles, all of them were killed violently. All of them. Without exception, some were crucified upside down, some were stoned, some were sown. Paul talked about in prison often, hunger often. They were moved, they, they were being pushed around like common criminal for the sake of Christ. Where is that place of suffering? Where is the place when the Bible is so clear that we should suffer with Christ? That if we will live with him, if we will reign with him, we must suffer with him. We do not only identify with the fringe benefit of Christ. We identify with him also, both in his death and resurrection. That is what your baptism signifies. That I go down, identify with Christ's death, and then I'm being raised up in the newness of life. That one of these days, when I put this body down, I shall be raised into immortality with Christ. That is the hope of Christians, not in the now. I can tell you that some Muslims that have not had a headache for years. If lack of headache and lack of sickness is the identity of Christians, Christianity has no point. If giving birth to children is the mark of a man who is in relationship with Christ, what of Shekau that is having children left, right, and center? All non Christians should be barren. Beware of the therapeutic gospel. No cross, no crown. No cross, no crown. Christ died as our redeemer. He also died as an example of suffering. That is the path to glory. The cross is the path to glory. God said, I have glorified it, and I've glorified it again. When we suffer as Christians, the glory of God rests on our head. Satan know it. Satan know it. When Christians suffers, when they are being martyred, when Christians were being burned to the stake, Satan knew he's losing the battle. Satan knew that these are God's children and that the glory of God is on their head. 
Number two, God has spoken to us in his son. It is clear from this passage that ordinary people cannot hear God. Man shall not live by bread alone, by, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, <clears throat> the death of human, but what Adam lost and what we lost in him all through the ages is the voice of God. Because the voice of God was taken up from us by the sin of Adam, men began to walk in darkness into idolatry, into building of the Tower of Babel, into doing all kinds of things. It is the voice of God that restore us back to where we're supposed to be, to where we ought to be. It is the voice of God that creates in us our real humanity. And because we lost that, it is only in Christ, it is only in Christ that God can be comprehended. Those who are not with Christ cannot hear God. You put a, beware of false prophets who purport to speak from God to you. God has spoken, God has spoken, God has spoken by his son and is here for you. If you want to hear God, listen to Christ, isn't it? If you want to hear God, listen to Christ. Christ is being inscripturated here for you. Finally, at the cross, Satan was defeated. Every child of God under his authority are being released. And the moment of conversion for you is a moment of deliverance. Let me, I, I want to be serious about this. The moment of conversion is the moment of deliverance. When Christ died on the cross, he defeated Satan and disarmed him. All those who are God's people, elect of God, before the foundation of this world, can no longer remain under his custody. Let me repeat that. When Christ died and rose victoriously by the power of the Father, through the Holy Spirit, all those that belong to God, elected in God, before the foundation of this world, can no longer remain under his custody. So from that very moment till now, until Christ comes back, men and women that belong to God are being released from the prison of Satan via the instrumentality of preaching. And they can no longer remain under his custody. All Christians have been delivered. All Christians have, have been delivered from the hand of Satan. There is a popular movement around the country called Deliverance Ministries. Deliverance Ministry says that a Christian can be demonized. Okay? A Christian, <laughs> I don't know, yesterday I was driving and I, 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 turned, I turned to one station and a man spent 30 minutes describing, trying to explain dreams that our, our Christian life, if you are a Christian, in fact, your life function by the dreams. If you have a dream, don't commonize it. Your dream is your reality. I turned to another station yesterday. I met another person talking about dreams, that your dreams are your reality. That is, you are dreaming, if you dream, you are eating in the night. Come, say, come, say today, 9 a.m. in their church, you are going to deal with those who are eating in the dream. If you are dreaming, you are having sex in the dream. If you are dreaming, uh, you, are bath, you are having shower in the dream. Uh, if you are dreaming and then you are wearing your secondary school, you are wearing your secondary school uh, uniform. Eh? I don't know I, if you are wearing a secondary school uniform. Come for deliverance this morning. If you are, if you dream and then you you see yourself uh, running, you are running, you are running, you are running the dream. Come. Or if you dream, you see yourself in the coffin. That is the, ah, that is the main one. You see yourself in the coffin. So you have to go there this morning. It's an anointing that, that can break all. Oh, uh, and then the church overwork itself. When the Bible is so clear, if any man, if any man, if 
if any man be in Christ, new life has begun. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Christians, do not seek deliverance. They have been delivered. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I need to, the reason why many of you are looking at yourself, Christian, Pastor, what are, yes. The reason why you are having, you having need of deliverance is we have to ask you if you are even a Christian at all. And then they are laying hands on a Christian and in some assaulting, and they say there are about 70 demons here. How come? 70 demons is living in a Christian that have the Holy Spirit. It is not possible for light and darkness to cohabit in a single person. Christians are children of light. They have been delivered. Because the prince of this world, Satan has been defeated on the cross. And I'm, and I'm not, I, I, I concur with uh, the DJ Ward, and uh, DJ Ward will be a Calvinist, but also will be charismatic. And he took, and before he died, he, I, he said, he said, 80% of those who come to church are not Christian. And this is a church that have like over two, three thousand men attendance every Sunday. So majority of those who call themselves Christians actually are not Christians. They are not. They are not. Being a Christian means you have been delivered from the dominion. The day of conversion is the day of deliverance. You are off. You can't be in the U.S. and be in Abuja simultaneously. You have been moved. When they left Egypt, they cannot be in Egypt at the same time and be in Canaan at the same time. They have moved. Physically, they have moved. Of course, once in a while, your mind played tricks on you to make it look like you are still the person you used to be. And then that's the work of sanctification, isn't it? Then the true discipleship, true sanctification, those things are dealt with. But say a Christian can no longer be demonized. You can't have demon living in you anymore. Of course, Satan can oppress a Christian, isn't it? Satan can, but the fight of Satan is just without, it's not within. That's the point I'm making. Satan can orchestrate and your, your car catch fire. <laughs> That's how far he can go, isn't it? Satan can arrange and your house caught fire. That's how far he can go. The devil can arrange and you lose your job. That's how far he can go. But as far as your soul is concerned, he has lost you, he has lost you forever. You are now a child of God, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. He has lost you. That's why Christ tells us that don't fear those that can destroy your, your body, but rather fear the man that can kill your soul. The highest the jihadists can do this morning is to behead all of us in this church. Even if all of us here this morning are beheaded, we have not lost anything. Have we? And it is to this church, regular church goers, Christian, this morning, are you a Christian? Have you been delivered? Have you been delivered from the power of Satan? And for those who are Christians today, are you proud of the cross? Are you proud of the cross? Is the cross the center of our preaching? How come Christians are ashamed of the cross today? We're proud of the cross. We are people of the cross. We are identified with the cross. The cross is the glory of God. The cross is the highest display of God's glory. In it, we hear the voice of God. In it, we see the victory of Christ over this world and over Satan. Father, bless us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.